Well, thank you so much. It's real, I'm delighted to be here, and I understand that we have a combination of both in person as well as uh, everybody in the ethers and the iCloud. Um, so those that who I can't see, welcome, uh, and uh, take notes. And uh, I'm here to answer questions. And you're here just as much as you are here physically. Okay. So. Um, I am going to talk about perinatal genetics, and I understand that the majority of you are pediatricians, yes, okay. or family practice, but yeah, pediatricians. So, the, and I think that hopefully I will be able to um, present to you that what I do these days as a perinatal geneticist in maternal fetal medicine is that um, I now live the entire full circle of life. Um, so when we talk about prenatal diagnosis, I hope that I will um, convince you that I have no idea where that begins these days. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I have zero relevant financial relationships with anybody. <laughs> um, next, please. So I do, um, I give this talk a lot, and um, I always start with this slide because um, I've been working as a perinatal geneticist since 1979, um, at a time where we literally just discovered karyotype and banding. Uh, I'm a little bit of a dinosaur, uh, and, uh, and um, in college, um, my thesis, um, the thesis that was uh, question that was handed to the uh, seniors for graduation uh, in genetics, which is what I majored in, was what propose a mechanism for X inactivation? So that was not that long ago, and you're looking at somebody who's still alive and relatively relevant, uh, and I spent most of my time doing maize and Drosophila genetics. So from there to human genetics and where we are today, um, it's, so I'm constantly humbled by the warp speed um, of science and technology. And, um, and so, and, and I also really want to impart on the point that um, fetal investigation could not happen, um, that there are two lanes really in fetal investigation and, 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 and that is that it allows us to access, you know, all the technology that has been developed over these decades to allow us to access the fetus either directly or indirectly. But it has to be in parallel with all of the molecular, the scientific, biological um, discoveries. Um, I realize that in this generation, I'm looking at all of you guys, that PCR is But I remember when PCR was discovered or invented, and we all kind of went, oh my gosh, you know, we went to Mars and Jupiter and came back. Um, that was that was so, and, and we now use PCR as if it was nothing, you know, it's water. It's water in our life, right? Um, so, and, and I think that, you know, beginning with obviously ultrasound, um, I started with um, a 3D ultrasound uh, with a box that was literally this big in 1979, and it was static, and it went ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. And we only did that to identify and confirm that there was indeed a pregnancy and that there was a fetus inside. Uh, and we did our amniocentesis blindly. Um, we did not use ultrasound. Um, and. Uh, and it really, really wasn't until sort of the mid-80s, maybe, that we were uh, engaged with the idea that we would use real-time ultrasound to guide our amnios. And so now we're doing 3D and we're doing 4D. Um, we do fetal MRIs. We do, um, we do CT scans. Um, the diagnostic procedures, amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, and fetal cordon synthesis are not passe. They are still there. We still need this. So this whole idea of I can do all this sort of stuff with, um, you know, cell-free DNA um, is still not in prime time right now, although I will say that that also is going at warp speed. And I will not be surprised if in the next three to five years, we will have um, testing that allows us to do uh, direct molecular testing for certain conditions um, off of cell-free DNA. Um, we used to do tissue. We used to do fetal tissue biopsy for skin disorders. Now we have molecular. 
Um, and then, of course, most recently and not so recently, really, is fetal surgery, fetal you know, intervention and therapy um, with the in utero repair of meningomyelocele. But don't forget, really, that we have been doing fetal um, uh, treatment, in utero fetal treatment, for a very long time. You know, it began in the even late 60s, I guess, early 70s, with in utero fetal transfusion for RH disease. We've been doing that for a very, very long time. That's fetal, that's fetal intervention, right? That's fetal surgery, right? Um, we've been treating um, fetal um, congenital thrombocytopenias with in utero, you know, platelet transfusions. Um, we have, uh, you know, rarely treated some fetal um, uh, thyroid dis uh, disorder with in utero treatment for um, fetal thyroid disease. So we've been doing it. Uh, and then, of course, you know, um, beyond that, there is the really, really prenatal access to the fetus, which is the, um, the, um, the, the, the blastocyst, right, the five-cell uh, blastomere, um, and doing pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But on the other side, as you can see, is the molecular development and the advances of that. And, you know, we talked about, you know, cytogenetics. Um, biochemistry, still there. Uh, maternal, I hope that I will convince you that maternal serum scre screening is not totally passe. There are still, but rarely, uh, conditions for which um, biochemistry for ex of, the, um, of the amniocytes grown at um, amniocentesis is still required. But in the old days, you know, um, prenatal diagnosis of um, Tay-Sachs was, was based on biochemistry. We basically cultured the cells, and we looked for enzyme activity. Okay. Of course, now we do DNA analysis, but, you know. Um, and then the Human Genome Project, right, is, you know, in the 19, 1991, is it, um, has also blown us open in terms of understanding our genome. Uh, and then, of course, our technology of sequencing, um, and then now most recently, understanding fetal trafficking so that there's DNA and other stuff between mother and baby that obviously they are talking to each other uh, during pregnancy. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's just a magical ride as far as I'm concerned. Um, next slide, please. Are you, is your? Oh, sorry, it was a double slide, sorry. Next slide. Got it. Okay, prenatal screening options. So um, th I think that this is kind of one of my most favorite slides because it actually hopefully graphically tells you that uh, NIPS or cell-free DNA ha has really, really, you know, been very, very positive for us in, in, in our ability to at least try to get an idea about an anomalous baby. So, um, so cell-free DNA as a prenatal screening tool is available during the entire time in pregnancy. Okay. So a really cool example is, you know, you get, you know, we're doing an ultrasound on a 32-weeker, and lo and behold, this baby has a huge Epstein's anomaly, cardiac anomaly, and mom's 39 years old. Femur's a little short, fem humerus a little bit short, what is the diagnosis? Differential diagnosis one through 10, right? It's Down syndrome. Before NIPS, the only way that we can confirm that is to do something that is um, invasive and therefore risky, right? But we can do NIPS to confirm that diagnosis, okay? And you know, the question is, you know, do you need to do that? Well, what if it was a 23-year-old, okay? I mean, I mean, the whole point is that confirming the diagnosis allows preparation for the family because it's not just the heart defect that we want to deal with, but there are all these other issues. And so you, you have the ability and the opportunity to non-invasively provide a diagnosis uh, for the family to guide them and for us to help them get ready um, for this baby. Um, and then, you know, these blocks tell you the different timelines at which the prenatal screening um, is applied. Um, so, next slide. So, 
Um, prenatal imaging ultrasound remains the most important tool. It is the tool of the MFM or the obstetrician to get a look at the baby um, early on. Um, we know that 3% of pregnancies will have an abnormal ultrasound. And we also, the studies have demonstrated that it's really, it's the surprise, these unexpected. I'm so healthy, I'm so low risk, but 75% of the time it is going to be the surprise of the quote, low risk family. Um, the 1994 was the first um, randomized um, control trial about sort of the utilization of ultrasound and demonstrated that, you know, the 35% of the group screen were, um, had findings compared to women who didn't have control. I would say that as studies have come through, um, ultrasound is not the end all be all, and the pickup rate is much higher these days, but it is still not the end all be all, but it's better than nothing. Um, and I think that you know having this information um, allows us to optimize um, the management options um, for the family. Um, from a obstetrical point of view, um, an early ultrasound is really important for dating the pregnancy. Um, I think that as you pediatricians, and I have neonatologists there, is this baby growth restricted or are dates bad? Um, when we're dealing with twins, um, are these mono die twins of which they go through, they have a whole different pathway of complications or are they die die twins? The early the ultrasound to make that diagnosis, to clarify that, the better it is for all of us in taking care of um, that pregnancy and those subsequent babies. Uh, next slide. Okay, first trimester. The, there's a tremendous value in first trimester ultrasounds. It's not just putting it on there and you know, getting a crown rump length and the date and you know, a heartbeat. Um, um, but as you can see, as early as 11 to 12 weeks, um, fetal anencephaly um, is diagnosable. You just do not see the fetal cranium. If you could imagine that we didn't do that until we waited till a 20 week ultrasound to find the anencephalic, what does that mean? Um, for the family, for their options, et cetera. Um, so here, really, you should, at, in a first trimester ultrasound, be able to diagnose 100% of the time um, anencephaly. Um, there are other things, um, cystic large cystic hygromas and phalloceles and cephaloceles. Um, some of the really severe um, limb anomalies um, uh, can. Um, you know, sometimes if you, if you actually do get a really good scan, sometimes you can see an early hypoplastic left heart. Um, but as you can see, it's varied between 50 to 99%. And then, you know, when you get down to open neural tube defects, hydrocephalus, skeletal dysplasia, et cetera, that's definitely less, only because developmentally those may not show up until that time, right? So, um, but... You know, something as simple as anencephaly really should be diagnosed in the first trimester. Okay, next slide. So in the world of prenatal diagnosis, we all talk about nuchal translucency and the thickness of the back of the fetal neck as a marker. Um, traditionally, and it, um, it has been used and still continues to be used as part of the calculation for the risk calculation for Down syndrome. So the larger the NT, the, the greater the odds ratio um, that this fetus might have Down syndrome. Um, I actually use it as a red flag. Uh, it is just a marker that something is up. It may be Down syndrome, but it could be other things. And we do know that um, skeletal dysplasias can present that way. Um, fetal hemoglobinopathies can present that way. So, it's, so I just look at it mainly as a red flag. Um, so next slide. And so I hope that this slide will show you that point, which is when you look at uh, the fetal uh, NT here, that once you get kind of at, here's the break point here, 4.5 to 5.4 millimeters, this is, this is at greater than 99th percentile, we're looking at subsequent, a marker for a major anomaly, 
a marker for something bad happening, a marker for chromosome abnormality. So this is kind of where we are here. So it is just, I use it as a red flag. Um, next step, or slide, sorry. And then, um, and I hope, then this is one of the um, papers that I use and our fellows and is kind of our Bible because that's always the question. When you have a family in whom there has been an increased nuchal and you've done all the workup that you could possibly do, you know, she's had an amnio, the microarray is normal, all, you know, three, 387, you know, carrier screening genes and et cetera, et cetera, and everything is normal, the echo is normal, are there any residual effects, you know? And this is a really good paper and, um, uh, and just basically tells you that when we're at uh, 99, greater than, when the nu nuclear is greater than the 99th percentile, overall, I look at this as relatively um, assure, uh, reassuring, at least at between 95th and 99th, you know, it's, rel it's reassuring. You know, once you get out here, there is some increased risk for any type of impairment, um, but um, you kind of depending on whether you look at the, the glass half full or half empty, um, it is, um, there is some residual risk, the bigger the NT, um, but I think overall it still remains reassuring um, for the family. Um, next slide. Okay. So we use now, um, so 2D is your standard, but you know, everybody's going to 3D. You go to the mall, you get your 3D pictures. Um, every once in a while, there's an anomaly and, you know, and we get called. Um, but I find, so when I wear my genetics hat, I find that for families, you know, when we are gonna tell a family that we see a cleft lip and palate, you know, what does that visually mean for them? We know what that looks like. Um, and we can show a picture from a book, right? But, and you know, I'm not sure that they, you know, I even like can really figure out what this looks like, but taking a picture of their baby and actually showing this to them, um, I think is helpful in the counseling um, for the family. And I think the other thing that I find really important is to, although we can see this cleft lip and palate, it actually shows the normalcy, the other part of the baby, rather than concentrating just on the cleft lip and palate. Because it's very frightening if we sit in counseling and we just talk about the cleft lip and palate. But it's the wholeness of the baby, being able to do a 3D of arms and legs and the little you know, feet and stuff, I think normalizes and reassures the family while allowing them to also listen to us about this. So, um, so I like 3D. Um, 3D is also super important when we find um, conditions that we're really concerned about. Like this is a profile of a baby with micrognathia. So for our peds and neonatologists, it's like, oh my God, are we gonna be able to intubate this kid? Where is the airway? What is the issue? Um, and so, and again, for us having a 3D of what this mouth looks like, so this is microstomia. Do we know that this is microstomia or is it because there's, you know, auricular condylar um, stenosis here? Um, and so um, helps guide all of us as a team, right, in taking care of this baby. Next slide. And so what we did um, is, you know, using this information, we can help guide the delivery and the intubation of this baby through something called an exit procedure so that we basically keep the baby on placental bypass, I'll, I'll allow our PZNT and neonatologist to secure airway so that we have this baby. This baby actually needed to be trached um, on, while on bypass, but that's... So this is... is can I say, is this... Uh, is this prenatal or intrapartum ECMO? I don't know, but anyway, or is bypass. Okay, so next slide. So um, other, other things, other screening modalities, fetal MRI, I know that you, know, you guys all think about, you, know, you, you are the recipient of, a, of an anticipated baby with anomalies, or neurotube defect, congenital diaphragmic hernia, et cetera. The first question is, did you get, a, did you get you know, an MRI? So we do use MRIs, and they are helpful. 
Um, this is a baby with, um, an, uh, who had an MRI um, who had a large um, occipital encephalocele. You can see it here on axial imaging. Here is the, um, here's the skull. Here's the front of the head. Here's the back of the head. You can see the, def the cranial defect here and two bulging um, cystic structures. Um, this is the same baby because this baby also had many other issues, had all kinds of contractures and skeletal abnormalities that I could not figure out using MRI or um, uh, ultrasound. And so we use something called a low-dose CT, it's a one-shot CT scan. And depending on how we kind of uh, ramp up and ramp down various uh, Uh, measurements, um, we can actually enhance um, the skeleton. And through this, it was really helpful for us to identify the hemi vertebra. You can actually see all the rib defects, the bifid ribs, the missing ribs. Um, it was also very helpful um, for us to look at the cervical spine because we noticed on ultrasound that this baby's head never moved in a certain position. And so it was really important for us to figure out whether this neck could possibly move or not because it impacted how we were gonna deliver the baby. This was, a, this was a baby that the family really wanted full intervention, so it, it allowed our neonatologist to sort of kind of understand what the mobility of the neck was when the baby delivered. Next slide. Okay, maternal serum screening. Maternal serum screening has been around for a super long time. Um, it, is the, it is the prototype of um, prenatal screening. So as you know, it started out in the 1970s with the finding that elevated maternal serum alpha fetoprotein was associated with open neural tube defects. Um, in 1984, it was discovered that a low maternal serum alpha fetoprotein was associated with Down syndrome. Um, and from that, came the development of a number of um, additional um, proteins added to the screen to increase its predictive value, if you will, um, so that we landed in the early 1990s um, with what we call the quad screen, and then in around 2000, the integrated screen, which is a first trimester screen, you know, lab draw combined with a second trimester lab draw um, with the idea that it really reduced our false um, negatives um, and false positive and increased our predictive value. And really, the quad screen or the integrated screen had, uh, was our mainstay um, for serum screening um, for the longest time until NIPS um, became available. So is it passe? Because nowadays, um, you know, everybody gets NIPS if they want it. You know, they go to their OB and basically by eight, nine weeks, they, they get their viability ultrasound and they get their blood drawn for NIPS and we're kind of like done. So is there any value to um, continuing um, maternal serum screening? Next slide. So there's a lot of debate in the maternal fetal medicine world about this. I will say in transparency, and I'm of the camp that I still believe that there's value in maternal serum screening. Um, but remember that there are four proteins involved. There's a really unique pattern to um, the different types of um, conditions. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is smith lemley opitz so smith lemley opitz uniquely has a very, very low UE3, and X-linked ichthyosis also has a very low uh, uh, UE3. The loss of the quad screen basically now have not allowed us to look for this. smith lemley opitz is a really big deal. Its um, clinical presentation is highly variable. Uh, it can be very severe in prenatal presentation, and we pick it up on ultrasound early or suspect it early, or it can be relatively mild, um, like something's wrong, but what? This really picks it up, and so we lose that option these days. Next slide. Um, and then I think that the other thing that I will add to that is that as a maternal fetal medicine specialist, um, the, um, the proteins in a quad screen also are placental proteins. And for us, it 
can be a representation of placental function um, or future placental dysfunction. So we kind of lose that information as well. But there's a hot debate right now about what we're going to be doing. Okay. Let's move on to cell-free DNA, which is, you know, what everybody's doing now. The whole principle of cell-free DNA, so, so the principle of cell-free DNA is that the fetus, the, the placenta, the placenta basically um, sloughs off DNA um, and it enters the maternal circulation. We actually all have cell-free DNA in our body. Um, they come from apoptosis of our cells and then there's all this free-floating DNA, so we have it. Um, but the placenta also does that too, and, but as you know, the placenta is really um, genetically a surrogate of the fetus. So that DNA also enters the maternal circulation. So how can we sort through, you know, why can we figure that this is fetus and this is mother? And so the whole point is that the size of the cell-free DNA, of fetal DNA, or actually it's always a misnomer, it's really placental DNA, is that the size of the DNA is 147 base pair versus mom's cell-free DNA is 167. And it's that difference in size that allows us to sort of sort through and, and, and identify that this is not of maternal origin. And then the principle of the whole thing, very simply, is that um, I have cell-free DNA in my body um, let's say for chromosome 21, I don't have Down syndrome, so my genomic copies for chromosome 21 is 2, right, or 2X. If my baby doesn't have um, Down syndrome, then the fetal or placental DNA entering maternal circulation is also 2X, right? So the ratio is 1, okay? Whereas if my baby has Down syndrome, I have three times more, so there's going to be more proportionately more cell-free DNA entering the maternal circulation. And so we do these mathematical plots, right, to figure out, you know, where we are if we see, you know, one point blah. Is this noise or is it truly a di diagnosis? So that's kind of how we do it. So same thing with monosomy X or um, is that, you know, I have two X chromosomes. If my baby is a male, the cell-free DNA will pick up a Y DNA, right? And so that's what actually determines that your fetus is male. But if, if it shows up that the fetal or the placental fraction of the X chromosome is below the one zero line, then, you know, is it noise or is it because this baby has Turner syndrome? Okay, so that's kind of in principle how this works. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay. So this is a landmark paper um, by Norton et al., Mary Norton out of San Francisco, um, that really looks at the utilization of cell-free DNA in the general population. And a um, huge study. Um, and what she and what I wanted to really impart on the, our audience is that it's good stuff. It is good stuff, but it's not the end-all be-all. And so if you look at, um, if you stratify for the types of patients you have, and you look at the performance of cell-free DNA in low-risk women, women, in other words, these are low-risk women in whom they have had a normal or negative quad screen, the performance of the cell-free DNA in predicting Down syndrome was very, very low. So I think the idea is that, again, it's a great tool for um, high-risk women because, you know, remember understanding that positive predictive value of a disease is really dependent on the, the frequency, right, of the disease in the population. So for high-risk women, definitely. Um, for low-risk women, it still, it still performs better. It still performs better than um, just maternal serum screening, but it's not as clean as you think. And I think that that's really important as we're um, taking care of our lower risk women with expectations that are a little bit different in terms of, you know, their pregnancy course. Next slide. So I think that the most important piece of information out of this paper is their secondary analysis. 
And what they were not prepared for but discovered was that there were a number of cases for whom they could not get a diagnosis. It was called a no call. Um, and it was kind of like it broke out into not having enough DNA to make, you know, a diagnosis with, you know, 95% confidence level, right? And so when they sorted through what this, what, why, what they found were a couple of things. One was that there were, there were six straightforward trisomies. Um, they were all detected by, they had positive serum screening, but the cell-free DNA did not pick this up at all. Now, I find that really interesting because then the question is, you know, the trisomy is also affecting the placenta, so that is a function of the placenta, and is this, you know, placental dysfunction. Um, they, then there was obviously triploidy, um, trisomy 16 mosaicism, and some others. But I think that the thing that was very important was that this was what came out of it, was that this is when we first realized that maternal weight um, basically affected um, or um, was associated with the um, a no call rate. And this is also kind of where we began to realize that we needed a certain fraction of fetal um, of uh, DNA, um, placental DNA, to make a diagnosis of a certain confidence level. So for us, when we do self-free DNA, the labs, you know, all agree that we report out what our fetal fraction is. Okay, um, okay next, next slide. This is also following that paper. This is also a super important paper. So um, Hagit Shani basically looked at um, 3,000 plus uh, amnios that were done between 2009 and 2014. And I think the most important thing was that among 220 um, abnormalities, 43% of those would not have been picked up. Clinically significant genomic changes would not have been picked up by cell-free DNA. Okay. Because of the limitations of cell-free DNA to just look for trisomies. Okay. I understand now that you know, all of the companies are, have what we call expen expanded cell-free DNA, where there's a whole bunch of microdeletion syndromes that they now screen for. Um, and, um, and it's being done, um, but I think that we have to realize that those conditions are exceedingly rare, and therefore the positive predictive value is um, uh, concerning, um, and therefore the false positives will be concerning. And I, I'll give you an example. A case in point is that a couple of years ago, we had a 43-year-old um, patient who did not speak English at all, um, uh, was a farmer, too busy in the fields. She got cell-free DNA without any consenting, she, and it came up positive for 20 GQ minus. And what do I do with that? Does the baby have 22 Q minus? And without an amniocentesis, do I go ahead and do a fetal echo? We tried to talk to her, she didn't understand. She said, I'm, you know, I, I'm too busy. My life is too busy. I'm not gonna drive all the way up to Yakima from where I am. It's a you know, 90 minute drive for something that I don't. Or does mom have 22 Q minus? Do I have to get an echo on her? What so that was so I think, you know, that that's those are real life issues. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, but I will say that, um, you know, it's great for late pregnancy with birth defects. Um, it avoids invasive procedure. We also, you know, we just have to remember we have to accept the limitations of, of the results and that we really are, it's placental DNA, so it's really a liquid CVS. And so we're really dealing with also the issues of CVS, which is placental mosaicism. Does this really represent the baby, or is it really the placenta? Okay, next slide. So this is, okay, next slide. Okay, so ACOG basically um, came out with um, their consensus statement. Um, that basically said, for, for a while, cell-free DNA was really um, 
limited to high-risk women, but ACOG came out with a consensus statement that really all pregnancies now should be counseled or offered the option of any type of prenatal screening. So, and it, that's super important to understand because, you know, whether a patient does one or the other, as you guys know, has to do with access, timing, money. Okay. And so you don't want patients to feel that if they can't do a self free DNA or can't afford it or whatever, that doing serum screening is an inferior test. You know, it's just as good. Um, it's better than nothing. And I think that that's a super important point because I've had patients in which I counsel and this is, well, I don't really want to do the self free DNA because actually there are things I don't want to know about that. Um, and they feel like, but, but then they feel like opting for a quad screen is an inferior test and they're not doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. So it's really offering the whole gamut of options based on the situation of the patient. Okay. Um, the other thing that ACOG says that if you choose one, stick with one. Don't do both. Don't decide to do self-free DNA and a quad screen or an integrated screen at the same time. Do not do. If one comes out positive, then move through the line. Don't say, oh, I'm going to do the other one because then I'll be. I had one case in which um, the self-free DNA was negative, right? But somehow she got a quad screen and it came out positive. And it was like, okay, got to stop there. So, all right. Next slide. The other thing I think that's really important is patients' feedback and reaction. This is the, a paper that came out that actually said that there are a third of women who actually had self free DNA regretted that. Okay. And here are some of their reasons. Um, a third of them said, you know, I really would have preferred that you limited the scope of the panel to what I really wanted to know or talk to me more about that. Um, they felt that there was misleading information, that um, it was, there was an inadequate pretest discussion, um, and also um, kind of misleading information about results. And that really had to do with ambiguous results. You know, the negatives were fine, but the ambiguous was not so fine. Um, and again, it, it all, involves, you know, this idea of education, communication, understanding, and scope of your counseling, which I know is really, really onerous. This, these concepts are so onerous. How do you even talk to a patient about this? Hard, super hard. Um, and so, you know, so obviously the suggested improvement is that the mode of offering um, DNA screening should be reassessed or that we should spend a little bit more time thinking about, you know, how we counsel our patients, which I understand in a super big, you know, busy practice. We have, you know, we have um, language barriers. We have education, health literacy barriers. Um, I know that it's really difficult. I forgot to put a slide in there, but um, the DOH, um, DOH actually has a, a site that has um, uh, videos that explains um, prenatal screening, um, and they actually explain it in Spanish as well as in YouTube. Um, if you just go on and go D uh, DOH prenatal genetic testing, you'll get there, and you'll just click on prenatal testing, and then it just opens up the whole thing for you. Um, so it's, it's, it's not bad. It's, it's actually quite good. So, all right, next slide. So moving forward and thinking, we are moving forward to using cell-free DNA to do uh, Mendelian disorders. So cystic fibrosis is something, if we know the mutations of the parents, we are now you know, moving in that direction. There are some labs who are able to do that. RH disease, when you have, um, when you have RH incompatibility, rather than doing an amniocentesis, um, or if dad's not available to see what his RH type is because it's a new father, then um, we can now actually do RH um, genotyping of the fetus using um, cell-free DNA. Um, so more things to come. Um, 
in the UK, this is very active, actually, um, using cell-free DNA for, Mendel for prenatal diagnosis of Mendelian disorders. Next slide. Uh, okay, cell-free DNA more than prenatal diagnosis. All of this stuff that we do as a function of prenatal diagnosis actually opens our world into discovery. It's the discovery of embryology. This is, this is a, a free moment into the window of the developing fetus, both morphologically and also molecularly. It's really incredible. You have the ultrasound these days to actually watch this fetus but then you now have these molecular pathways and genetic pathways. And in some ways, you can even argue that for those pregnancies with fetal anomalies for which um, the pregnancies continue, you have a gift in understanding the developmental abnormality of that particular condition over time. And it's a gift, uh, uh, and I don't take it lightly. Okay, next slide. So it first started with... Um, uh, this case. So um, Diana Bianchi is now the head of NICDH. She is, you know, the pioneer of um, cell-free DNA, and at the time, um, the, comp the lab um, was doing cell-free DNA for the country. So we sent some samples to her, and lo and behold, she found we had found some unexpected discoveries. Like, whoa, there's something going on, and one of which was that. So this was actually our case. So we sent self-free DNA on this patient of ours um, who had had a renal transplant. And it came back um, that she was, that it was male. So, um, and so, but she got her 20-week ultrasound and the sonographer says, oh, look at this, you have such a cute girl. It's like, what the hey? So what, where did the X chromosome come, Y chromosome come from? The donor. So that was our first discovery that, whoa, there's other DNA that we're picking up out of this. Okay. And so next slide. From there, unfortunately, it also revealed to us that cell-free DNA was able or ha is picking up either a malignancy, a current malignancy in the mother, or potentially a future malignancy in the mother. Okay. So... And this is, this is now, so part of it now is that the results come back and, and some of the malignancies, the lab will go, whoa, you guys, we are seeing way too much fragments of DNA everywhere. So we call it a, a splash. It's just everywhere. Um, and so that's our cue that something is up, okay? We recently had a case, actually, where um, mom um, had self-free DNA uh, at, I don't know, around 10 weeks or something like that. And uh, it, it, the, actually, the director of the lab called the physician and said, there's something going on. There's just splatter everywhere. There's fragments of DNA everywhere. So she came in, um, and she also had hyperemesis. So on exam, unfortunately, she had this huge mass in her uh, abdomen. And what it turned out is that she had stage 4 colon cancer. So... So this stuff is real. Okay, next slide. Um, we also now also discovered that there are certain things that also resulted in what we call a no call or low fraction. So for whatever reasons, um, women who were on anticoagulation seem to have a higher frequency of no call. Um, so is that are we doing something to the placenta with anticoagulation? I don't really know. Um, it does not seem to be related to why you were anticoagulated. So whether you were anticoagulated because you had a mechanical valve versus anticoagulated because you had, you know, lupus anticoagulant um, syndrome, we don't really know. But this is an observation. Next slide. So here we go. Now we're actually using cell-free DNA to track rejection. So the transplant people are doing that. Um, it's very cool. Next slide. The other thing, oh, go back. The other thing is, um, yes, transplantation. Uh, okay, next slide, sorry. So I think in summary, you know, self-free DNA does give you early diagnosis, can give you early diagnosis of genetic conditions. Um, it can be, a, 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 it, 
it may give you more information that you would like to know. Um, it can be an early biomarker for maternal health. And now the direction really is that we, th you know, the cell-free DNA is probably uh, a function of maternal fetal uh, signaling with each other, the language for each other, um, which I think is very cool. And I think that, you know, it begins to be a window into the genetic mechanisms for fetal and maternal conversations in pregnancy and how the mother and the fetus makes adjustments in pregnancy. Um, so that's on the frontier. Next slide. Um, quickly, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, you know, we're taking blastocysts. Remember, though, when we do these biopsies, we're still doing, um, we're not really doing the fetus proper. It's still an, it, a surrogate, so it doesn't really, really tell you for sure um, that the fetus is or is not affected. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Um, just a reminder that we still do fetal therapy in fetal, through fetal cortisynthesis. Next slide. Um, okay, really quickly, just a couple of examples. Um, this is a fetus that has a huge, not only does it have nuchal, but it has um, hydrops. So here's the fetus, but look at this halo all around the body. So it's completely hydropic. Um, and um, at the end of the day, we worked it all up for RH and, you know, uh, thalassemias, and, but it could be metabolic disorders can present this way, parvo, skeletal dysplasias. So she didn't want anything invasive, so her maternal T21 was positive, her, her maternal 21 was uh, for trisomy 21. She had a fetal demise at 18 weeks. So the most important thing also, and I tell our residents and our fellows, is that this just tells you that you have three copies of chromosome 21. It does not tell you how those three copies come, right? So, and that has reproductive implications because if it's a translocation 21, that can be inherited, right? So you never stop here and say, oh, she had Down syndrome trisomy 21. So the products of conception must undergo, right, formal karyotyping or testing to either sort through whether it's a trisomy 21 for which there's a 1% recurrence risk versus an inherited translocation, right? Um, next slide. Um, sex chromosome aneuploidy. I'll go through that really. So we talked a little about monosomy um, X. So the predictive value for cell-free DNA for Turner syndrome is like 30%. And the reason is the following. Um, we find it more often in our older moms because actually there is, as we get older, there's somatic loss of the X chromosome in our body. <laughs> and so that colors our reading of the cell-free DNA. So when we get a monosomy X, we have to go through all of this. You have to sort of like, you know, baby has the pregnancy has to get an amniocentesis, mom has to get a karyotype to sort all of this out in the absence of any ultrasound markers for, for Turner syndrome. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, I think this is, um, this is another case of um, a cancer that we picked up. Um, she had type 1 diabetes. Um, she only wanted cell-free DNA. Um, not much going on. Um, severe preeclampsia. Um, and um, she has some noise in her cell-free DNA that we really couldn't figure out. And she did go through a major workup. We did everything, breast, the whole thing, because she had some noise, but we couldn't figure anything out. So, you know, then you, have, you wonder, well, maybe it's a reflection of placental dysfun dysfunction because she actually, she actually developed severe preeclampsia with HELP syndrome at 35 weeks and delivered. So we repeated her self-free DNA um, at two weeks postpartum, and um, it came back again with a lot of noise so that we couldn't resolve. Next slide. So, um, and, and this is next slide. Uh, so what happened was when she came back at her six weeks postpartum, we found a breast lump. And when we went back and we actually looked at her cell-free DNA and we actually drew, redrew her blood and we specifically looked at chromosome 17 and amplified it, there she was positive for her HER2 um, mutation. Next slide. 
Um, this I had just talked about, so we can, s next slide. So I want to end by saying that um, this, I hope, shows you the full circle, at least of my work. Um, this is a woman, she's, she was published, so, but this is a woman in whom we made the prenatal diagnosis here of a rare um, 6Q21 microdeletion um, who grew up um, and we became pregnant and you know, we took care of her. Um, she had um, a baby. Um, she had actually a couple of babies. Unfortunately, um, two of them were affected with the same um, deletion. So, so this is kind of full circle. Um, next slide. This is again um, some of my families. These are um, identical twins with um, type 3 OI um, who I've known since they were babies and then they grew up and each of them have had children. Um, and um, same with, um, this is one of my other family and this is a mom with um, spinal muscular atrophy type 2. Um, who many, many years ago would have never survived, um, but here she is, and um, we took care of her, and, he, and she has a healthy daughter. So it's really full circle, where do you begin in terms of your screening, right? Um, next slide. So I just end by saying that in terms of fetal prenatal diagnosis and treatment, it, is, it takes a village. It really takes a village to make the diagnosis, to care for the family, both medically, emotionally, psychologically, um, to get that family and that baby um, uh, taken care of holistically. It also, you know, um, offers families choices. And so not all families will make that choice of continuing, but at least it give some choices. And so I will say that from a maternal fetal medicine and surgical perspective, if a family makes a particular choice of not continuing the pregnancy, then the earlier we make that diagnosis, the safer it is for the mother. Um, in, and as I speak from a surgical point of view um, in that respect. Um, next slide. So this is kind of where we are today. Do we start with the adult to find the screening? to move in this direction, or do we start with this to move in this direction? Because sometimes we make the diagnosis in the fetus, and in retrospect, we can go back and make the diagnosis on the parents. And, and I think I, that's my last slide, I think. <laughs>